I pretend I never told you to do that, Patrick. Which doesn't it doesn't help yeah. you now, and you're probably you're probably sat there thinking you asshole. But ultimately, I put on well, one coat of resin. I was like, "Fuck this!" <laughs> <laughs> Rip so, that shit off and threw it in the trash. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, this discount that entirely. My mm. recommendation would genuinely be. Welcome back to the Craftsman's Collective, a podcast designed to help makers in the concrete, wood, and steel industries improve their businesses and lives by discussing our common struggles, tips we've found along the way, and how we can combine our unique perspectives to create even more spectacular pieces. Today my guest is Martin Haddock. He and I sit down to talk about nothing but shower pans, which <laughs> sounds a little limiting, but there's a lot that goes into making a shower pan. Even though it's a pretty simple thing, there's a lot of things to take into consideration. We talk about everything from forms to grouting it, we don't really talk about much in way of casting the actual piece. Since that's primarily dictated by the exact project that you're working on, it may be a sprayed finish, you may be pouring it, you may be placing it by hand. Those are all very different ways to do it, but essentially everything else is the same. Martin and I have known each other for quite a while, so we go off on several tangents in this episode. So what I did was I have decided to split this into two episodes, one that is basically condensed down to nothing but the shower pan items, and then the other one where it includes the, the tangents that we go off on if you'd like to see us talk about some random stuff, all related to concrete, but it's just what we do. As usual, check the chapters or show notes for timestamps if you're looking for something specific, and any resources we mention will be there as well with affiliate links if possible if you'd like to support this channel. Thanks again, everyone. I hope you enjoy the episode. So shower pans. Just got done installing mine the other day. I, yep. I can see why you'd say that you'd never do them. Like, they're just not worth it. Um, so I know that we already talked about the order of things, but the a really... Do you do them now? Or like, have, do you price them to where just like you just rarely ever do them? So the the interesting thing with shower pans, so I've made, I've been doing this for seven years. I think I've made about 10. So it's just more than one a year. Uh, I, might, I think it's 10 or, 10 or 12 or 13. But in terms of and why I said to you, I don't like them is because they are a glorified sink, obviously, but you can't charge the money that you want to charge for that. You can, you know, I shouldn't say that. I've always felt that you, I felt that you can't charge the money that you want to for them because mm -hmm. essentially shower trays are a means to an end. You know, there's not really anything decorative about them. They're just there to drain water when you're having a shower. So in terms of how I've priced them, it's always been high. So I, I price it as what I would for a large sink. And that's why I've only made a few of them. So like, for example, the last one I made was for the showroom. And that was about a year ago, or maybe more than that. I've priced many since then, um, but that was the last one I made. Maybe it was 18 months ago, maybe two years ago. Um, mm -hmm. Because any time that anybody comes to me, I don't come out of the gate and say, it was too expensive. I, you know, I'm not negative. I just say, yeah, I'm happy to price it. Um, and I give the price and I never hear back. And I know why, because it's, you know, it's like five times the price what they'd pay for one off the shelf. And I get it because it's not, mm -hmm. it's not like a sink where you can charge, you know, four to twenty, thirty thousand dollars, you know, depending on the style, design, size, and who it's for and whatnot. So um, that's the reason I've never liked doing them because they're a pain. Not just the fact that you can't really, you can't really charge what you know they're truly worth, and it's because, as you found out, you are going between like you know three walls. You know, and sometimes you're even having to go against tiles that have already been put in, so you're kind of retrofitting. And then even if even templating them, <laughs> they it's, it's not like a you know it's not like a kitchen where you're templating between cabinets and walls, um, because yeah. ultimately a kitchen you can always leave little gaps here and there because it's a kitchen you can silicon it with shower trays. It's in a, it's a waterproof, you know, it's a waterproof piece. It has to be you know waterproof the area so it doesn't leak all over the house and cause other problems. So um you've got to be exact i mean if the, the few that we've done and installed them they've been tight like generally quite tight i've had to you know take off a few tiles that were on the wall to get it in and then they've had to towel back over it so um 
Yeah. So I'm, I'm look, I'm happy and more than willing to tell people how to do them, you know, best ways I've found to form them. Um, you know, but ultimately I would be lying if I said I enjoy doing them. Yeah. I mean, the things I think with the problems that I ran into the, with the ones that I had to was really thinking is if, if it's worth it or not. Um, and I, I don't think that you can know whether it's worth it or not before you've done one. Um, mm. And that's the kind of the catching point for me is I'm almost inclined to tell people, like, if you're considering doing it, just make one that you is not for a customer. Just, it's just just mm. make one and then do like a faux install in like the corner of your shop. So go through the entire process like you would to just to see if it's even worth it. Because I think you, I was shocked at everything that went into it. Cause like, it's one thing to say, it's like making a big sink. And it's another thing to make a really big sink. That's not only long, but deep. That was the thing that got me is just like, cause then you're, well, I, don't, I guess I don't want to get into that too ahead of time, but like the, <clears throat> I really think, I don't know. And after you've made so many, I'm curious to see if you agree with that is before you even have a customer, if you're considered about making them, just make one just either for yourself, for the shop, just to put over in the corner and see if it's even worth it for you. That's mm. one of the things that I really think would be a good exercise. Uh, it is. I don't think many people would actually do that. <laughs> no, I mean, a lot of gluttons for pain. Yeah, because a lot, of, a lot of us joke, don't we, about, and you said it with Simon in his podcast, about so many things to make, too many things to make. And ultimately, mm-hmm. you know, I think we sometimes in our industry have these, you know, I wouldn't say delusions, but we have these kind of grand, grandiose ideas to do things. And we'll, you know, we'll test this and we'll do that. Like, you know, like post tension is a perfect example. I've done, I don't know, 20 pieces that are post tension, you know, maybe, maybe less, maybe more. I haven't kept count, but I've done a fair few of them. And everybody that's asking me about them, it's like, oh yeah, I'm definitely going to try it on a test piece first. And I, I just have a bit of a wry smile <laughs> thinking, yeah, that's not happening because <laughs> nah, you won't. <laughs> yeah. I, cause I said that and I didn't, <laughs> I just thought, eh, this will work. And it did work. Ultimately I found out, you know, better ways to do it and you know how to make it mm-hmm. work more effectively. But yeah, that's yeah. I agree with you. And I will, and this is the irony I think of me, you and everyone in the industry, we will all sit back and go, yes, you should definitely test it first. And I don't think many of us stick to that truly, um, you know, on, on, on many occasions. And I think ultimately that comes down to because we're just so busy, you know, running businesses, you know, working for clients, you know, answering emails, the administration side. And, you know, more importantly than anything, the family, I think that we're all just too, I think we all, I think we all think we're Superman. And I think we all think we have more time than we have. And as you know, we have the same 24 hours in a day. So, yeah, by all means, if someone wants to make one for their for their workshop, then then do that. Otherwise, don't bother. Just just make it, you know. But to be honest with you, yeah. you, the irony of that is I am actually making one for the workshop. So we're doing a little, um, you see how dirty I can get, um, especially mm-hmm. spraying. So Ashley's kind of got fed up of me destroying all of her washing machine. So I have a washing machine in the workshop to wash all my work clothes. And I try and keep the van, our vehicle, really clean. And getting in it all dusty and dirty kind of defeats the purpose of that. So we're installing a shower in one of the toilets here so I can just, you know, finish work and get a shower here. So I said, I'll make a shower tray um, Mm -hmm. and some wall panels for it. So... I am actually going to stick to my own advice and actually make something for the shop. Not for the first time, but mm-hmm. I am actually going to do it for once. But yeah. What did you, what did, well, what did you yeah. find surprising about it? Because the thing is, well, the reason I say it's a big sink is because, because I didn't come from a construction background or anything like that. I was always kind of naive to things or more, more so inexperienced. Like for me, a shower tray mm-hmm. is just a big sink. That's just how I see it. Whereas, you know, when you say there was a lot more involved, what, what do you, what do you mean by that? Well, so like, I don't mind sinks that much cause I can reach pretty much everything, unless it's a really long one. I can reach everything from basically one point, mm-hmm. um, with the shower tray, I ended up having to do a lot of work on the floor 
now my shop's not as big as yours and I don't have really a good method to get. So I basically took it from the workbench <laughs> aside. I tried to push it my lifting gantry uh, way. Yeah, I did. I didn't have the gantry. The gantry was still in the living room from the coffee table. <laughs> so I hung a crane from the rafters. Well, as you know, if you have a pivot point or yeah. you're lifting something and you don't have any way for it to slide appropriately, things can go bad real quickly. So the shower tray actually fell off the workbench onto the floor, directly onto concrete. So I ended up smashing two corners and a spot in the middle of it. So I had to repair this. I was like, I'm not making this fucker again. Um, <laughs> so it fell four feet onto the corner. Um, but isn't, isn't, isn't but so I ended up working on it on the floor. But then... Just just to quickly segue there, isn't it amazing that you drop like a one inch thick, basically tile on the floor, you know, at four foot, which is like for anyone in Europe listening, that's over a meter, one point two meters, and it's all it's done is really chipped the edge a little bit, you know, in the center. Whereas if you imagine any almost any other material, especially tile, that had, obl- had you know obliterated into a thousand pieces, it's pretty cool mm-hmm. though. So even though. Even though you yeah, dropped yeah, it and thought, I don't want to make it again. It. You've kind of learned by accident how strong your stuff is. I find that, I always find that fascinating. Yeah, fortunately, it was on the curb side. So, I mean, there was a lot of meat there behind that. So, I, mm. yeah, yeah, I mean, it, I think I did it like three and a half inches wide. It's like four yeah. inches tall. So, that's, that's a, well, it makes it pretty heavy. So, that's a pretty heavy piece of concrete going smack into the floor. Um, but I did not like. I would probably do a few things different on the next one if I ever make another one. I will make the taper to the drain not as excessive as I did. Mm-hmm. I think it ended up being somewhere between like a quarter and a half for every foot. I think it was or something like that. I'd have to, I'd have to look. Um, yeah. So I would make the the taper more shallow. I would get a flexible backer and flexible pads so that I could actually just go all the way around and not have to worry about the yeah, rigid yeah. pads hitting those, those groups that fucked me up a big time on this piece. Yeah. Um, and I really didn't like having to kind of work my ray around the perimeter of it so that I could really reach everything and get in there really well on the processing and the grounding that it's a kind of a trivial thing, but it bugged me. Um, as in you I like you having a use hand pads or I, well, I used hand pads but I also used on the big meat of the section I, I still used the the alpha and when yeah, yeah. did that um, but I like having a single point of reference whether I'm measuring whether I'm standing whether I'm reaching I, I like having a solid base from which to work on and the shower pan didn't allow me to do that especially since it was on the floor so you right. have a pretty unstable base that you're working from. So if, if somebody's making one, I really would recommend trying to get it up off the floor and getting it about waist height probably is where mm-hmm. I, w- I would feel comfortable working on it. Yeah. Uh, I feel like it's a much more stable base from which to work on, which seems like a, a trivial thing, uh, but I think it could have a pretty decent uh, impact on maybe most of all the enjoyment of the prog- process because like it's not an enjoyable thing to make. Um, Mm. but I I don't know. I mean, I don't think that I would ever do one in a shower that has a finished floor already in Yeah. or finished walls. Mm -hmm. Maybe the walls would be okay as long as they give you a really nice buffer. Um, yeah, but I don't know. I I really don't think I would ever do one in a fit with, if there's a finished floor, it's just like, with how we installed the one that I just did, I just the chances of something getting messed up are just too high for for my comfort level. So we've done. Well, first thing is then. So when I'm making it, there is, if I remember correctly, um, a plumber told me this the first one we did like six years ago, seven years ago, and I think there's certain in the UK specifications like depend on the length and the size it has to be X amount of fall to the sink. Uh, to the sink to the to the waste and 
I think for the first one, I copied that. And so I think the first one was like six foot long, maybe three foot wide. So, you know, about two meters by six, 700. And it was a central waist. And I think I did about an inch fall because that's what I was told to do. However, the thing I learned from that shower tray is it was horrible to stand in. And that wasn't the customer oh, yeah. telling me that. When I was installing it with my socks on, I didn't get a shower. Yep. <laughs> but, you know, you, you're installing it, you know, you're silicon around the edges and all that jazz fitting it. And I stood there. And honestly, for me, after, you know, after being used to standing in my own shower tray at home or this, the bath at home, it felt like I was on a fucking hill. Do you know, like on a steep hill oh, standing yeah. there? Yeah. So, mm-hmm. and I was like, I'm never doing that Same. again. Regulation, yeah, reg- regulations or not, that's just, it just not wasn't very nice. Customer never complained mm-hmm. or said anything. Um, but it's not the point. So now I do probably like 10 mil, unless it's a really big one. And the biggest one I've done was 2.84 to 2.4. Um, and the thing with that was, is that the drain was one end. So, we, you know, the water kind of, even though the shower's at one end itself, when people, it was people would walk to the other end to get out of the shower. And then there's only going to be yeah. water there. So you want the water to kind of run. Do you know what I mean? So... Um, even that one, I needed 15 mil, so less than three quarters of an inch. So I have like a really shallow fall now. Um, now the one in the yeah. showroom I'm looking at, I keep looking at this for reference. That is, I I was, I thought I'll try something different, and I kind of fabric form that. Um, and Fuck it's obviously not. For you, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I I thought I'm glutton for punishment. Let's learn something different. But yeah, you know, ultimately. Mm. With that one, I'm looking at it now, and honestly, God, it looks like there's no fall on it. It's so shallow. But when I was wet polishing it, I leveled it up. <clears throat> you know, made sure if it was in someone's house, would the water drain from the edges to the scent, and it does perfectly. Um, but I digress. So I always have like 10 mil for the fall if it's central. You know, maybe a bit more if it's kind of off to one side. Um, one of my pet hates of this industry, and I've I've done it before in the past. I, I don't do it now, but I have in the past just to clarify is I hate those fucking lines that you have. Those, you know where the triangles are? Oh, God. It's like a steel mm-hmm. sink. And I just think, I understand why we get it and I understand why people do it, you know, and, and I get it. But for me, just me personally, it's just a pet hate of mine. It just feels, I think it cheapens a product. So, in the, and the funny thing is, all it takes is, if you're making it a plywood or PVC or whatever you're using, all it takes is a bit of time with an abronet on an orbital sander just to, to round it over, mm-hmm. just to really smoothen them out. You know, follow the line to what, you know, follow the line up. Don't over sand it so you've got a, you know, a hub taken out. But it's, you know, really sand them and really take the time, smooth them over with a bit of body filler, a bit of Bondo, um, you know, because then you've got a finished product that looks seamless. You know, it hasn't got these god-awful lines from corner to, to waste um that's the other thing i would say now in terms of getting back to what you said i have installed them on finished floors and i've installed them um on floors that you know it's still a building site so it's just a joist in the floor so the ones on finished floors are easy to just lit, like you said they got a curb at the at the at the um at the edge so you know, you've got your shower tray and then you've got a little curb dead easy you know it's just a flat panel on the bottom plonked on the floor you know, and essentially on the day, you have to kind of lean it up. The plumber puts his um, flexible hosing on, you know. Over in the UK, you can get um, what's known as shallow shallow shower tray um, wastes. And it's basically like a two or three inch shallow waste that kind of comes out and immediately has a right angle on it rather than a big long one. Um, we always recommend those with a flexible hose. So there's plenty. It's, it's easier to install for the plumber is what I'm getting at. And I've also done them, like I say, on floors. I just adjust now for those ones. Like the ones in the showroom, um, I literally don't have a curb on them. So you can imagine, you know, the top, you know, make it simple. The top is flat, but obviously you've got that kind of, you know, upstand in the middle, upside down. So you've got a kind of upside down pyramid where it meets at the bottom if you're only doing 20 mil thick. So what we've had to do is kind of plywood, basically have like a big square in the floor. So the shower tray sits flat and it doesn't rock. Um, and then glue it down. That's all waterproof, the membrane first. We go in, it's nicely plywood, nice little hole in the center, and then we just kind of plonk it on. Um, and obviously the plumber fits this thing and that gap and everything, you know, that's, it, it's awkward and it, it's a pain in the ass, but then you have this, because then they what happens is then they tie it up to it. So you've got a perfectly seamless, well, 
I say seamless, it's still got a tile joint next mm-hmm. to it, but you know, or um, a piece of steel beading, um, you know, for the offset for expansion and contraction. But you've got this kind of like flat seamless surface, and it looks much better, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, all right. So I guess let's, well, you've already started talking about the plumbing hook, but interestingly <laughs> enough, the plumber that's on the job that I did courteously in a roundabout basically sort of way said, I'm not hooking it up. <laughs> I'm like, okay. So I had to hook ours up. Um, yep. And what we ended up doing was leaving the stub out, um, not attached so that I could pull it out, out of the floor. Yeah, yeah. And then we attach the, I don't even know the, what the, the name of it is, but it's basically, you have a, a PVC piece that's got like a flange on the top and then it, yeah. it's a threaded insert that goes through and then you screw on the bottom of it and it's got a, a rubber gasket and a plastic gasket. And then it's got the, uh, basically this, the bolt or whatever, what do you want to call it? Screws on and it clamps it down onto the, onto the, the piece. Mm-hmm. And so that was the type that, that I ended up using. I forgot to take into consideration the thickness of the aesthetic part that kind of squeezes down on top of it. So my drain sits a little proud, which sucks, but it is what it is. Yeah. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll stick a, uh, a really long, I don't know, probably a, a paint stir stick or whatever with a, um, cause we have to solvent the two PVC peep pieces together that's still in the floor yeah, yeah um so i'll stick the little brush thing or whatever on the end of that swab the inside of it and then stick the pvc piece back down and then mm-hmm. you put the the plumbing thing back together i've heard that people use other kinds too but i don't have any experience with those and so i don't really feel comfortable saying how to use them but if you have like if you're on like a second floor and you have access to it below like that makes everything infinitely more easy than if you're doing it yeah. on slab or on grade because like that's just because you got to think once your slab goes down like you're done like there mm-hmm. is no more messing around with the plumbing yeah um the, the, it's funny you say that. so i've just looked online now so we in the uk we call them i'm on the page looking now so it's in they're called a high flow shower tray waste um or low profile or slim something like that so that's kind of generally what we mm-hmm. use and it's it's literally like from the top of the actual waist to the bottom is like two or three inches max. Um, and they're what we recommend because they're easier to fit with a flexible um, flexible plumbing pipe on it that goes to the main plumbing. Um, but where was I going with that? So Yeah, so when, so when you're fitting them, like you say, here. yeah, so when, when you're fitting them, because like you say, once that's down on the ground, especially if you're going between three walls and you're kind of getting it in, it's not like a countertop where you can just slide it in and you have, you know, be done with it. You've got to basically push it into a point and kind of, you know, even lift it forward to the back walls there and the shower trays up here. So the plumber can stand behind, do all the plumbing, and then you've got to kind of lower it down. So what we do is, is get in position to a point, lift it up, let him do all of his plumbing. Sometimes it has to be kind of lent over more so he can finish. And then essentially we just used, um, little bits of foam, like um, one and a half inch foam on the floor. So then we basically lower the um, lower the back down. The front is on them foam. And then it, it is generally a case of, <laughs> sounds bad saying it Drop. on camera. Yeah, basically lift it up yep. and then move the foam and then kind mm-hmm. of get it to where your fingers are just to the fall and pull your fingers out. <laughs> mm-hmm. So if health and safety are watching, it's like, yeah, you're not doing that again, mm-hmm. but... That's that's the only way we've kind of really found to do. It. Or sometimes you're lucky that you can get a strap in and then kind of you know pull the strap out, literally yank the strap out afterwards. If you've got like a really thin ratchet strap, um, you can lower it down with that. And then because it's so thin, you can kind of just like pull it, and it'll kind of come out. And then you just got to push the shower tray back a bit. But then that's the worst thing about them is installing them, making them, and mm-hmm. that's the easy part. Installing them is cannot it can be you know unpleasant especially when you're between three mm. three walls that more often than not those walls are shaped like bananas so um yeah but that's the fun of our industry hey the challenge is apparently yeah. are there any things that you do on the templating st- uh, side where where you're taking into consideration like how the glass is going to go 
whether it's shower door or shower wall or anything like that? Like are um, you making, when you're doing curbs, are you making them a certain, like do you have a size that you prefer or? So yeah, the curbs I, I have made, I can only go off the ones I've done. So these three that I've made, four off the top of my head, I'm just thinking of them now. The curbs on those were about an inch, an inch deep because the glass they used was about um, a quarter inch, like six millimeters. So I made I made the edge an inch, 25 mil, the curb. The glass was six. Now, what I did was use a piece of plastic in the mold, basically set that, glued it over the curb. So then obviously it had a very tiny, shallow little dish in the curb. So when they set the mm. glass in, they could actually, I, I asked them if I could do this. I've got a picture somewhere. They could set the glass into that kind of little small recess and then silicon around it. Mm. I did that for two reasons, because number one, they could then silicon inside the groove, put the glass in and then nicely silicon around it. It's completely watertight. Number two, my, see, the reason was my fear was, and it's me, me you know, me and classic overthinking. When you've got sealed concrete, like I used, Amiga on the last ones I've done. I've used Amiga on all of them. In fact, and before then it was H12. But I digress, it's been a topical. You know yourself that once it's sealed and you put silicon on it, even a good quality silicon, that will rub off. It's not like it bonds to the sealer because it doesn't, because it's too smooth. So my fear was like, they just sit the glass on the curb, silicon it, and then it just fucking wear away and start I mean, moving a little bit. Um, mm. So, you know, I did a little recess, glued it in, silicon round it, and it looks better as well, rather than just being plonked on top. A bit yeah, like... See, um, here they use, we've got little brackets that actually, the glass actually sits on. So I don't think that the glass sits directly on... I'd have to look. I know that on ours, the glass doesn't actually sit directly on the floor. They sit on the brackets, and then mm -hmm. the silicone actually theoretically if you were to put silicone in there it would actually squeeze out the other side um so that's interesting to see that they i'll see i don't know i'll see if i can dig out the pictures right on there mm -hmm. i'll see if i can dig them out now i definitely had them on my other phone but as you know i <laughs> i'll tell a story i hope someone gets a laugh out of this because i find it funny because you said this was simon you know you, you said you envied him because he's mr cool you know it's like eh, whatever now, when I started, I was, I'm not going to lie, I was like, oh, fucking hell, it's broken, or, you know, it's, I'd get annoyed or whatever. But you quickly learn. And when I say quickly, within like a few months, you know, six months, a year, that when this stuff goes wrong, like Simon said, there's nothing you can do. It's literally, eh, whatever, just carry on. You know, concrete teaches you that. It teaches you to be more resilient, you know, especially mentally resilient to what goes on with it. But I digress. <laughs> so... I was here till about one in the morning last week, um, if not the week before, and I was finishing up doing what I was doing, putting everything away with the forklift. We had a big skip here because I was re ripping all the workshop apart, doing it all up, and I've got a locker where I put all my clothes, and I put my phone in the locker. Anyway, 12 o'clock, putting everything away, and I'd picked my phone up to text Ashley and say I'm coming home in about half an hour. And... <laughs> I then carried on putting everything away. About half 12, one o'clock, I'm thinking, right, okay, time to go home. I've got my phone. Now, where's my phone? So I'm shouting, hey, Google, where's my phone? And it's basically, if I shout that to it, it'll say, hi, I'm here. You know, really posh voice. Hello, I'm here. Um, nothing's happening. And I'm thinking, that's strange. You know, if, have I put it on silent or is it, you know, the battery died? And I'm looking around. And then it suddenly occurred to me that I think it was in my pocket. I may have left it on the, you know, as you call it, a dumpster, the skip we call it outside. So I went outside looking for the skip and I couldn't find it. And then, you know, as you do, like you, you ever ask your wife, where is something? And then you think, well, actually you, you look for it. And then you think I'll ask the wife, but that's got to be the last resort because she's going to go right to the fucking thing you're looking for and then berate you for it, saying that you're, you know, you're blind. So the, the point is, I started checking my pockets again. And I was like, it's not in my pocket. And then I looked down. And during the day, I must have ripped one of my pockets. So it's it's um, it's work trousers. And they have like little satchels, like little flaps on them. And I'd, mm -hmm. it ripped. I literally ripped right down the seam at the edge, like halfway down. And it suddenly occurred to me that the phone was in that pocket. It fell out. So then I'm on the floor at one in the morning with my head torch on, looking around. I must have looked like a lunatic. 
And then I just found my phone smashed to pieces. So like literally I'd driven over it with the forklift. <laughs> so if anyone's listening, Android phones, um, yeah, not forklift proof. Um, well, mine certainly wasn't, yeah. but back to the point on that phone, I have lots of pictures of the shower trays on my temporary phone. I, uh, I don't have any pictures, so I'll dig them out for you is the point. <laughs> It's going to be fun editing this one. You're freaking all over the place. I need to get like a... You know me. That's a, actually put on Facebook like yesterday. a code word or something. Yeah. yeah I, I put on yesterday, didn't I? But you know, a wise man once said, be careful you let on your ship because someone will just basically sink the ship if they can't be captain. And then Rico Ramos mm-hmm. is messaging when someone like taking the piss out of me. And then it entirely backfired because everyone's then saying, yeah, that Martin sends me long voice messages or... He, uh, if you speak to him, he'll speak about 15 different subjects in the space of five minutes. And it's because mm-hmm. the thing I, I'm, I think I'm not really, it's not really a, a common thing that I tell people because I have ADHD, my mind is a thousand mile an hour, as Ashley says. And as my counselor told me the first time I met her, uh, when I was going to her, <laughs> after 20 minutes, she said, um, are you okay? And I said, I'm, I'm fine. You know, consider I'm sat here and I'm talking to you, I'm enjoying it, I'm fine. Why? And she said, I'm fucking exhausted. What are the exact words? And I was like, oh, have you had a long night? And she went, not because of what I've done. She said, you've sat here for 20 minutes. And she said, honestly, it's like a fucking minigun <laughs> of words out of your mouth. <laughs> like one thing to another. And she said, I feel tired listening to you. So, yeah, I do apologize for anybody listening. I, I don't m- mean to. It's just my mind is just... It runs at a very quick pace, shall we say. And I know it can be tiring for other people. <laughs> so apologies. I'll do two versions. I'll do the full version and I'll do it where everything is cut nicely together. <laughs> I, I am famous um, for saying, long story short. So if you make the shortened mm-hmm. version short and then put and longer version. <laughs> yeah, long story short, call it that. Mm. Um, so templating. Now that we're yes. 30 minutes in and we haven't even gotten to templating. Are there any things any that difference? people should take into consideration for templating? Because I ran into a few things that I surprised me. We'll say it like that. Um, I generally do the same as what I do in the kitchen. So if it's a three-sided wall, um, I will leave like um, three sixteenths of an inch. I'm getting good now with these freedom measurements, aren't I? So mm-hmm. um, three sixteenths or three millimeters like on, on one, one side, so the left or the right-hand side. I will leave that small gap. You just use packers um, against the wall and template to them. And that allows me enough room to kind of slide it in, if you like. Um, I do take my right, you know, basic things, take my speed square, my right angle, you know, check the wall, see how good they are. You know, um, if on one of them, the walls were sticking inwards, so like the back was wider than the front. So even though leaving that small gap, there's no way you can slide in because you're trying to slide a rectangle into, a, you know, effectively a triangle or a wedge. So mm-hmm. <clears throat> for that, I still left that gap, but you have to kind of put it in up at the angle and then kind of go down. So for those ones, you always, you always have to kind of, what I do is I make the template and then I lift it out how I'm going to install it to find out where it's going to catch on the wall. Um, same with kitchens. I always kind of, you know, if it's like I say, if the cabinet to like, if this is the back wall and that's the front, if the cabinet to like that, then I always kind of build a template, leave that small gap on one side, and then I'll lift the template out as I'm going to put it in. And if the template gets stuck, you know, your concrete's going to get stuck, then I adjust it for that and make the client aware. So I'll make the gap a little bit bigger. Um, or we tell them, you know, I'm going to have to smash that wall out or whatever. I make them aware of that, you know, there and then. And then I put it in the contract and the emails to them. So um, in terms of anything else, I, w- I do differently off the top of my head. Um, not really um, that I can think of, in all honesty. But you know, what did you find you out? Just use, do you use door skin or what do you use for your actual templating yeah. material? Again, another, I, can, I should just move to America with all these terms I've got now. So... I think you call it Luon, mm-hmm. is it? Basically, it's like a um, quarter yeah, inch. Yeah, Luon or door skin. Yeah, Luon, yeah. Yeah, quarter inch plywood. It's like six millimeter ply I use. Um, just hot glue it. Hot glue it together. I've got a very expensive hot glue gun that I have. Um, you can get battery adjusters or um, what they're called. Basically, I can put my DeWalt batteries on this glue gun 
and um, I can use on there. So it makes the glue very hot. So once it's glued together, it's fucking, you snap the wood to get it apart, which is important, by the way, because when you're like kind of moving templates around, you need a good glue gun and, and good quality glue that gets hot enough that it sticks to wood and bonds it properly rather than kind of sticks it. And then, you know, yourself, you get it kind of back to your workshop and it's kind of like unglue itself. And it's like, oh, fuck. So I also make sure that I've, um, I pencil. So where I've, when, I, when I finish templating, where all that kind of wood is glued on, I like um, use a permanent Sharpie, permanent marker around all the wood. So I know if it does come off, I've got a general idea. And I also take measurements of the walls and write on the, you know, write on the template what the measurements of the cabinets are or the, the measurements between the walls are. So if there's any problems and stuff, you haven't got to go back to site. Just so you know, Patrick, your yeah. videos pause for me. I, I can, your face is just permanently staring at me like fucking Hellraiser. <laughs> yeah. Just so you yeah, know. I know. Yours is really pixelated too. Yeah, no, you're good. Um, is there anything else that you write on the template as far as like, uh, I don't know. I always write top on the top of mine so that I know which one side goes up, which seems like it'd be <laughs> obvious, but I put it on there just because I don't want to fuck something up. Uh, I put yeah. my finished edge and I put an arrow. Um, yeah, I do. Good question. Left wall, Good question. right wall. Yeah, so I've, I've just templated a kitchen this morning, so it's fresh in my mind. I know it's, you know it's a kitchen, not a shower tray, but same principle. So I put the edge thickness, the color, the client's name. Um, I have them sign the templates once it's finished. So they literally will sign them all, whether it's them or a site manager or a construction manager. Someone has to be there to mm -hmm. sign them off and say they're happy with everything. Um, I write on, yeah, left and right. You know, I put this way down. I actually write this way down. Um what else do I write on it? So like I'll mark where cabinets are. So like if I'm putting ribs in the concrete and I want the ribs to sit on the two cabinets where they're screwed together, I'll write rib or actually put a piece of, you know, plywood or loo on, on that cabinet and then write rib for concrete. Um, I'll mark where overhangs start and end so I can make sure if they want the bottom to be flush. I know this is going off and doing shower templates in kitchens now, but I'm just trying to give a generalization. Um, and then the biggest thing that I do and one of the best things I've ever done is I actually film what I have done, um, there and then. So I'll get my phone out and I'll say like, you know, um, date is the 1st of January, 2023, um, template for, you know, Mr. And Mrs. Smith, um, four templates made. And then I will literally walk over to each template. Even if it's a shower, I'll walk over there and I'll literally talk about the template I've just done while it's fresh in my mind, like template one. Because sometimes you have the work tops are going to be a different thickness from an island. And again, I know I'm kind of flip-flopping between shower template and kitchen template, but this is just good information, if you ask me. So I will say, like, you know, template one is 30 mil. Um, the color is this color. Um, you know, this left-hand wall is sticking out so far. Or, you know, it's got a bow in it. Or this pencil mark means this. I actually, like I say, the point is I talk about exactly what that template is and all the information I need. At this morning... They didn't have the cabinet finished for where the cook is going. So I kind of had to template how the cabinet will be. Now, if I'd have wrote that on the template and walked off and in three weeks time, I get the template out. Mm -hmm. Even if you got pictures mm -hmm. of what you've done on the site, you're going to be sat there looking and going, what the hell does this mean? Yeah. yeah. So I honestly yeah. now, I, I, I genuinely can pull up a video on my phone and it, I basically email it to Ashley and she puts it in a cloud and we have documents for all the clients there now. And I can pull it up and go, right, okay, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, there's the template videos. And honestly, it saved me so much time and hassle because honestly, there's some times when I've got the template, right, okay, I know what I'm doing. Let's watch the videos. And I'll say something really small that's quite actually a, a very important part. And you go, oh, shit, I nearly forgot about that. Do you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I think if anybody is going to template a shower, you know, left and right walls, you know, talk on the video, you know, make a video of it, talk, to, talk about what you've done for that template and why get the client's signature, um, you know, color thicknesses, all those things. And also as well as sometimes clients haven't decided on certain things, like how thick they want it to be, how thick they might want the shower tray curb. So just write it on the template to remind yourself because I'm not a robot and I can't remember everything. So having those reminders and even having, I have a notepad as well. I bought myself a nice leather bound notepad, write it all down. And then when you come to do that later on down the line, you'll thank yourself, believe me, because there's, there's been a few occasions in the very the very distant past where I've had to ring a client who's like five hours one way away and go, um, you do me a favor. Can you just measure your cabinet? Mm. 
Uh, well, and you don't want to put panic into them saying, oh, because the template's fucking smashed. Do you know what I mean? So it was mm-hmm. like, you know, just, mm-hmm. just done a double check. I've got the measurements right. So I've never had a problem. But again, you know, just, just mitigate those issues and just take a video and just write all the information down. Mm-hmm. Do you frame out the where the drain goes for the on no, your template? No, if if literally just for saying say it's a big square shower tray, it's going to be in the center or the right or the left. I will literally wherever centrally it will be, I put a piece of plywood or loo on from you know, the front to the back, right across the center of where the shower tray, the shower waste will be, and I just basically put a big circle in the center of that, saying this is the center of the shower tray waste. And then if you've got like a four inch shower tray waste or whatever it is you know i know from that dot you know i need to go out in a radius of like you know two inches that way and two inches the other way yeah i wonder that seems like man i'm really jealous i I don't it'd be interesting to see if we could use like flex pipe here or something like that because that would make hooking the showers up like infinitely easier like i had very little wiggle room with like where my drain was like there was like because like the plumber didn't chisel out didn't give me that much of a chiseled circle where it was so like when i when we were to lay it down flat to install it like because that that nut that goes on that is so big like i had such little wiggle room i completely framed mine out i wedged (laughs) the luons completely against it against the pipe on both left right and then i put two short little runners or whatever on the front and the back so like i knew exactly exactly where my, my plumbing pop is so if you've got like rigid pvc or something that you're going to be using <laughs> no i'm, prob- I'm looking again probably, for you now oof. yeah so like if you have rigid pvc i from my very little experience i would really recommend like framing that out as well as possible especially if you have very little wiggle room this is so in the uk again it's called Flexible shower outlet pipe universal, um, flexible hose. You know, sometimes you know yourself is like certain specifics. You know, it's like anything, isn't it? Don't just ask the question; ask the right question. So sometimes it's mm-hmm. kind of you need like a proper, you know, search term. But yeah, literally just flexible shower waste or flexible shower pipe, um, mm-hmm. waste pipe. Sorry, and yeah, there's shitload of options here. Um, I think talking of which, any people that are listening in Australia. They have, I think it was Adam and Damanu who told me this. They have a, like a special kind of waste, and I'm sure it's like patented, and you can only really get it over there. And it's this really cool, really low profile tr- waste for baths and showers. I can't remember what makes it different, but it's like it's like this really ingenious solution that makes like fitting like our bathtubs and our shower trays like really easy. I can't remember what it was. I'll try and find out because you know in America you're probably able to get it in America somewhere, but try and find it but yeah flexible pipe especially with bathtubs uh, we've got three bathtubs now um i'm doing a couple soon and <laughs> installing them is like installing a giant rock in someone's house mm-hmm. so a shower tray is not often a panel you can lift it up baths like a like a giant rock or a giant pebble not very easy to kind of lift up because it just wants to roll away so yeah. having flexible waists is definitely ideal for shower trays and baths, 100%. Yeah. Um, oh, so the, the problem that I ran into with mine. So usually, usually in a shower, the perimeter on the floor will be the, the narrower is the narrow, the narrowest. <laughs> it will be the skinniest. We'll just say it like that mm-hmm. because you have, Lots of buildup of your waterproofing membrane, and you have the fabric that they've got in there. So theoretically, that should be the narrowest point. So if you're templating to that, everything that's above that should fit just fine. Mm-hmm. Apparently, in the shower that I or yeah, in the shower that I did, I did not check this, and I should have. My the way that we put it in because I had to use a mortar bed. Yeah. So my I had to get the shower pan so the very top of the shower pan is basically well here let let me explain it like this i have the height of the mortar bed i have the height of the pvc that is sticking out the bottom of the shower tray and then i have the thickness of my shower tray and that is the height at which my template needs to see if it can fit in um 
to that space. Well, it turns yeah. out that space was considerably smaller than down at the floor. Yeah, yeah. So I had to pull the shower. Like, we couldn't even get the shower tray in. I had mm -hmm. to take a grinder to it and grind an eighth of an inch off both sides so that I could mm -hmm. get it to fit in. So that would be something that I would recommend is bring a, whether it's a speed square or, or something that's going to let you know like, where your skinniest point is. Cause like where you were talking about with um, like your walls being skewed. If, if, if your entrance is skewed outwards, it's not that big of a deal because you can just slide it in. Mm -hmm. But like if the, the height at which you have to push the shower tray in is skinnier than the floor or where you template from, you could run into a problem. And I definitely did like that. That caused a huge problem. Like we had to grind it and take care of the dust and everything. It was a huge, and then reseal yeah. it. And not, not fun. Not fun. Well, what um, we've, so in terms of fitting it, my advice now is different from my advice two years ago and it could be different again for two years from now but in terms of fitting now shower trays we the last one i did for a customer i swore to myself that i won't fit another one and that's probably why i've not made any since then because except the fact that i price them quite high for what they are it's also because we don't fit them so we say it's supply only now that's not just because I don't like making shower trays. It's because I think fitting them is a waste of our time and our time is valuable. And it, it's not about our time, you know, needing to be in the workshop, but ultimately people as there's plumbers and builders that fit shower trays on, you know, millions of job sites all over the world. We're not talking about, yes, it's handmade and it's bespoke. And I get that, but ultimately for things like a shower tray, nothing special, it's a shower tray. So mm -hmm. I don't need to be there fitting that, you know, you into when, when they've asked me, how, how would I fit it? So how you fit any other shower trays, nothing different, nothing special, you know, it, it weighs a little bit more, but ultimately, you know, you don't need me to fit it. So when I say my advice is different, I won't fit a shower tray ever again. So for me, some of those issues now, when I say it's not my problem, it's not me being dismissive or I don't care. It's a case of we don't charge that we refuse to do it. So it's not my problem any longer. And thankfully, I don't have to think about them. Um, and that's that's the way we're trying to go with other things. Well, like countertops and worktops, that's how we're, we're trying to go with that as well. Because you, when you talk about where you were putting it in and where you templated it and you couldn't get it in and shave it off, we had a massive kitchen before Christmas. It was 14 foot long the countertop, all beautiful custom terrazzo in the finish. And the thing I told you, I had to match an old concrete floor. And yeah, it took a lot of work. And then we were installing it. They'd messed up the cabinet. So the cabinets are six inches higher than where we were when we templated it. As my best mm. friend in, in the UK, one of my best friends, Andy, said, I might as well have templated the fucking ceiling because yeah. I templated six inches further down the wall. It wouldn't fit. And it basically blew off a big chunk of concrete on the edge. And that wasn't down to us, that was down to them. But ultimately, someone's got to pay for that to be fixed and someone's got to rectify it. Luckily, with our contract, it states that we assist with installation and we're not responsible for things like that that go wrong, especially when cabinets aren't level, cabinets aren't where they were when they were templated or this, this, and this. So ultimately, they're having to pay us to remake the piece because the walls were skewed and they were six inches taller than where I templated. So um, all I would say to people is shower trays, if you want to do them and you can get paid well for them, because ultimately they're always going to be custom as well. You can't just, I suppose you can just make a standard shower tray size and people have to kind of just go with it. But people generally come to us because it has to be custom to fit in an awkward area or an awkward shape or do you know what I mean? So I think ultimately with things like that, just, just, make them and my advice is just say look it's delivery only you know your builder or your plumber can fit it it's no different from you know a resin rock one or a plastic one or a you know a corium one or whatever they're made from so that would be my advice mm. don't even entertain the idea of installing it okay so that's what you mean by fitting it is same thing as yeah. installing don't bother oh, yeah okay. that, that's just look that's just my opinion i understand people think differently and that's the beauty of the world and the industry we all have different thoughts and opinions but for me 
I'd rather be in the workshop doing something more productive. And like I say, shower trays, they're fit all over the world every day by tradesmen, plumbers, you know. Mm-hmm. Think about where your time is valuable. And for me, fitting a shower tray is not a valuable use of our time. Yeah. All right, so what about mold making? Are there any particular materials that you like using? Any particular materials that you dislike using? I know that you and I had a little back and forth about this uh, <laughs> as I was making mine. But... Um, so I have used MDF, melamine, PVC, fabric, and that's it. So I've kind of done most of the options available for shower trays. Um, mm-hmm. Fabric form, don't bother. It's as much as I'm looking at the shower. Tray, I'll send you a picture, Patrick. But as much as I'm looking at it now, and as shower trays go, is it's beautiful because it's so seamless and it looks like it's just flat, and it isn't. It's just not. The juice isn't worth the squeeze because we all know what fabric forming is. You know, draping cloth and you know resin and filler and all that jazz. When you're doing a big wide area like that, it's it's a lot of filling. It's a lot of faffing round. So forget that entirely. Pretend I never told you to do that, Patrick, which doesn't, which doesn't help yeah. you now. And you're, prob- you're probably sat there thinking you asshole. But ultimately... I put on look. one coat of resin. I was like, fuck this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ripped so, that shit off and threw it in the trash. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this, discount that entirely. My mm. recommendation would genuinely be two things. If you don't care about those lines that are going to show up from using like a PVC or, you know, or, or wood, then just stick to the basics, you know, make your little four triangles and fill those in, sand it done, you know, and honestly for that, for that route, PVC would be my answer because there's a lot less, you know, I don't use resin. I'll get to that in a second. I use something called a mold varnish over here and it's incredible. So I'll get to that in a second for the European and English folk listening, but PVC is easy because you just cut your triangles out, you know, you stick them together. You literally can hot glue the joints and then just take some, you know, abronettes from like a 400 to like a, a 2000 with, um, you know, car body paper, wet sand, the hot glue, just the hot glue and the PVC together. And honestly, I've done it so many times. It's perfect. The hot glue and the plastic, once you've sanded them, they come out seamless. It's, you know, it's the easiest way. It's the quickest way. It's the most cost effective way. Um, but again, you have those lines because you you would have to sand the PVC to a point that in the UK, and I can't speak for you guys over there, our PVC is like, it's like a foam backed PVC. So the PVC itself is like, you probably say an eighth of an inch, like a mil, it's dead thin. So if I was to kind of sand those grooves, whether, you know, your grooves to your sink off, I was to sand them and sand them a PVC, I literally sand away the fucking plastic. So it defeats the purpose of it. So if you want to go for a really seamless piece, you need to use... Um, I prefer, oh, what's it called? I prefer MDF, um, um, if you're using resin because it's, it's nicer to sand. It's easy to work with, um, MR MDF, moisture resistant MDF. So you can really body fill those, you can body fill all those four lines, really spend the time sanding them over and really kind of caressing the surface to kind of smooth them out to the point that when you run your hand over, it just feels like a nice kind of ride rather than like a fucking sticky, pointy line. Um, and then fill it in resin. It. Um, that would, they would be my option. So if you want to go for a really nice bespoke, seamless looking piece, go the MDF way. If you want to just kind of go the, you know, they've not paid me enough, you know, I want to get it done and finished, which is fine. No way is correct. It depends on what you want to do and the client wants. Then I would say PVC and just hot glue the joints and wet sand them to smooth them out and off you go. Now, if you are going the MDF route, um, I use a mold varnish. Now that's called Formlac. That's the name of the brand. It's Formlac by Armcon in the UK. And it's a two-part solvent-based um, varnish. And it is it is pretty special. So even now, if I've got like a piece of melamine, it's got like a divot in it or whatever, I can literally just body fill that little divot or whatever, or even if it's sanded through to where, like sometimes you get melamine and for some reason he's saying this piece of shit and it's like you can see some of the chipboard. In the past, I'd get another sheet off the shelf and cut that for strips now. I can literally use this varnish and literally just feather it out over the melamine 
and it's waterproofed and I can do one coat and it's dry in an hour and I can cast on it. I've generally made, genuinely made sink molds where I varnish, this, this is the truth, genuinely, I varnish them at 6 a.m. and then by nine o'clock I'm casting on them. You don't need to use wax, nothing. I can just use Aquacon um, that I spray yeah. on with a HVLP and it, it, honestly, it comes off perfect. It's it's incredible. You know, resin, resin is a, is a massive time sink which I, you know, you have to sand it between coats and get it nice and neat. You have to wax it and all this. This varnish, I can just brush it on, back roll it with a foam roller, and it leaves like a textured melamine feel. And yeah, I can, you can get a primer for MDF so I can prime it. And it's like generally like two coats of this stuff and done. And that's it. Spray it with Aquacon and cast. So I know it doesn't help people in America, but I believe there are other options. I think John Bass, because John Bass asked me about it and Joe Bates. And Nate Lawler, um, he asked me as well. I'm sure they found similar things over there. Um, I'll reach out. Anybody in the UK listening or Europe? Yeah, Yeah. anybody in the UK and Europe uh, listening, give me a shout, you know, send me a message and I'm happy to put you in the direction. But so, yeah, I would then, you know, get the shape, in your case, resin it. And then, you know, if you are using resin, just use like a a beeswax or sonite wax from Smooth On's pretty good, you know, one or two coats of that. And then I prefer Aquacon Mm -hmm. or. Tom Fisher sells 20 VOC. That's another good one. 20 VOC. That's another great one. I like to spray my MR release on with a HVLP gun because it's easier. It's quicker, less waste, believe it or not. Um, mainly because it's faster. It <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know me. You know me and my lungs. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Now, I yeah put a mask on, spray it on, done. Um, I, I like Aquacon and 20 VOC because they're water-based. And, yes, when you air, you know, when you atomize and put those things in the air, they're not good. I wear a mask. However, you know, it's a lot. It's a, there's a big difference between using a water-based one like that than using something like a solvent urethane that you're atomizing. Um, you know, mm-hmm. a lot harsher. So, <clears throat> what I ended up doing with after the, geez, I don't know if I told. I think I tried three or four different ways of doing the mold for mine. Uh, and it was just like I, because I, I started out like that too. I was like, oh, I'll just try something new, learn something new, or whatever. And I was like, so I got partially way through this learning something new. And I was like, this is fucking stupid. Like, I don't have time to be messing with this right now. Cause this, this project is already way past when it needed to be done. Um, our PVC, I, as far as I know is PVC all the way through. Um, so if somebody wanted to round those ridges, I'm pretty okay. sure they'd be able to do it here in the States. Uh, I just used the cheap PVC sheets from, well, Cheap is relative. PVC has gotten stupid expensive, but I uh, just used the cheap one from Home Depot, uh, half inch thick. And what I ended up doing was I put a a dot in the middle, the exact middle of where my drain needed to go, and then cut out the perimeter of my, uh, basically the base of my sink area, I guess you could call it. And then I ran a pencil line from the corner to that uh, dot from all four of my corners. And I took a track saw and I ran on both sides of that pencil line. So I I make the pencil line disappear, but I get a nice thick kerf in there. And then I took a hole saw that was the size that I needed for my my drain. And then Mm -hmm. I drilled, I bid both the kerf and the, that, drain or that uh hole saw all the way down to where there was only like maybe about an eighth of an inch left of pvc material Mm -hmm. and then i took the uh the infrared heaters that we use to cure like the sealers and all that Mm -hmm. (laughs) and made this go a lot quicker but you got to be careful because i got some bubbling on the pvc heat that pvc up and then i took a four inch uh height of pvc tube so i needed my drain just for example sake let's say i needed it to be three inches high well i cut a piece of four inch pvc pipe three inches long and i placed that exactly in the mold where i needed it to be Mm -hmm. and then i put my pvc base on top of that and i started heating it once it gets to a certain point I could then press down on it and I, that gave yeah. me my recess for the drain. I got my taper for the piece 
And then I also got the ridges because it was able to collapse on itself. I think I've got pictures. This is probably not making any sense. Um, and then I epoxied that to the rails that gave me the height of my tray. If that makes any sense whatsoever. Yeah, yeah no, it does, yeah. So you basically just curve the back out and then kind of just, because mm -hmm. you've curved it, you can essentially just <clears throat> put your raised drain section on your baseboard and then you can essentially just bend the PVC to the point where you haven't got the line, you haven't got the cutouts, it just bends. So you've basically got a seamless mm -hmm. piece ready for casting. So I'm going to say, it's funny because you say that and as you were talking about it, I had, I'd say Jason from House of Concrete, he built me six sink molds not so long ago, and that's what he did. But he used mm -hmm. uh, MDF and did it with that. So literally just groove the back out and bent it around. There was no filling on the top. It was just it was only body filled mm -hmm. or bondo where the pins were to nail it down to the top of the sink mold. So that's another way. It's probably the fastest way. It's the best way. Um, that is one thing that yeah. I skipped that I shouldn't have. Um, I went ahead and... Um, I hot glued my rails down to my melamine and then I yep. epoxied the, my base to the rails. I'm mm. not sure what happened. I don't know if it was, I don't know if some of my rails on my table aren't exactly flat or for basically something happened and I ended up with a dip or, or a bow or I, I don't remember which, but it ended up being where the epoxy was so strong that it actually pulled the entire sink mold, whatever you want to call it, up off of the base plate of melamine. <laughs> so it literally folded up on itself. Yeah. So then I had to go back through and epoxy that down to my base plate again, my melamine. And then it ended up happening. I guess epoxy doesn't stick to PVC as well as one would hope. Yeah. So as I'm spraying the piece... As I'm spraying it, I've got a full mist coat on this entire piece. The mold starts to pull apart. Wow. It is literally starting to separate. So my rails are attached to my melamine still. It was on there so strong, and the forces pulling it away were so strong that my basically my, my tray started to lift up off of itself and straighten out. Mm. <laughs> After it has been sprayed, I'm like, mother, like, what the fuck am I going to do? Like, mm -hmm. I've already made this mold like three times. I'm not making this sucker again. <laughs> so I was like, you know what? Screw it. I was like, I might as well give it a try. I get the air gun out, I have the air nailer, and I just start punching nails into it all around the perimeter. Mm -hmm. So I'm basically making holes in my mist coat and shoving concrete down into a divot all around this thing. I'm like, you know what? It doesn't matter. I've already got this. Everything's batched out. There's nothing I can do. Let's just go ahead and try it. So I get that up. I get my rails up. I get the outside pieces because I'm spraying. So I've got everything set up. I get the thing all the way together, pouring on my back or get everything out. I'm keeping a close eye on this fucker because I'm just like, I'm just waiting for my thing to start rising or sinking because it's like seeping into the other thing and sure enough it held held just fine i flip it over i yeah. got like divots every once in a while but that i just easily process that out um but so i would recommend when you're making your mold if you're going to use some type of chemical attachment put a, a mechanical fastener in there of some kind um, yeah. uh i ended up with a little bit of rust in in my finished piece uh but my style it doesn't really matter because you just can't really see it uh yeah. so, do you yeah. want to say about all that this is not this is in relation to kind of hel a holistical response i'm going to give to that about pinning it as you're casting it it's slightly go off topic but you know me by now mm -hmm. the thing is in this industry we all like to think that we have everything dialed in so whatever we're doing we've got everything in order you know one to ten you know you know sequentially you know one two three four five seven nine ten the truth is sometimes you have to do what you have to do to succeed or survive and what i mean by that is like you're saying you just pin nailing it join the cast and it's like well it is what it fucking is you know let's just carry on and i think some people would be listening to this 
or I would think some people may be listening to this rather than be thinking, oh, I, I wouldn't do that. I'd clean the mold out and re-go and I'd do this. And ultimately, I would say to them, I'm sure there's been certain times when you've been doing casting or making a mold or installing or doing something where you have just gone, you know, let's make this work. Let's make shit happen. And I think we all do that. But I think we all want to come across that we have it all figured out and we're all perfect. And the fact of the matter is, is that we aren't. You know, I joked about recently, you can be as, it can be as simple as filling the mold up with a mix. And you've, you've calculated that you need 200 kilo, you know, 440 Ooh. pounds of mix. <laughs> and you get to the end and you're like a quarter of an inch short from the top, right? And you're like, oh, fuck, make more mix. So you make more mix and you fill that up and it's still not fucking full. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you're like, right. And I've done this, you know, and, you know, people that have been here with me will tell you the truth. I'm not going to lie. I've gone, hmm, I've got an idea here. Let's just shove a bit more sand into it. <laughs> yep. Let's, let's make that fucking work. And that's not me being lazy saying I don't want to make another mix or it's it's more of a case of saying it's like nine o'clock at night or, you know, whatever. It's been a long, hard day. I just want to get this finished. Let's just shove a couple of handfuls of sand in there, mix it round and then pour it in. Excellent. And it, I've done that, if, you know, a number of times. And I think... See, I don't find it funny that you pin there like that. I think it's a kind of, you had to make, you had to figure it out. That was the only option you had. You made it work and it's worked out just fine. So I don't see, I don't see the harm in that really. Don't get me wrong. If it had come out like shit, you would be cursing yourself. And I get that. I've been there myself, but sometimes there's nothing wrong with just making shit happen and getting stuff done, you know? And yeah, if, I mean, if I, I couldn't have it, gotten it to work, it, it, it yeah, I think, yeah, I, think, yeah, I, think I would have recast think, it, but. I think this industry as a whole should take a step back, look at what we're doing, which is making something from a bag of dust and kind of just chill out a little bit and think, look, as much as we're all, you know, we think of ourselves as master craftsmen of concrete, you know, just take a step back and go, do you know what? Sometimes you just got to make shit happen and do what you need to do. You know, we're all here trying to survive, trying to earn a living. It's, let's not all get a bit pissy about, oh, Patrick nailed a fucking a mold together mid cast that wouldn't happen to me you know martin threw a couple of extra handfuls of sand in in a mix to you know to fill the mold up you know i wouldn't do that and the reality is i know people have thought that way and then they've done things that i necessarily wouldn't mm-hmm. do but at the same time they were just trying to make shit happen so you know i commend anybody that's just trying to get shit done and trying to you know fix things that happen because that's the thing about concrete is we know it's got a you know what we do is got a mind of its own and sometimes it's down to just concrete being a fucker and sometimes it's down to we're human and we've made a mistake and we forgot something you know but ultimately makes you happen and the desk i'm sat at in my showroom right now the geometric desk i was midway through spraying that and the the mark three swivel face coat gun got jammed twice and mm-hmm. the mist coat must have sat there. Like, you know, like you finish spraying and like you you fill your mold up. Sorry, you fill your gun up and it's kind of like that kind of mist coat line sat there and the gun jams. And I'm like, fuck. So I literally threw the mist gun to the ground, went and grabbed another one. That hadn't been cleaned out by previous members of staff. And I'm then like, oh shit, what do we do? But at the time it was like, do we clean it all out or... Do I, you know, f- fix the gun or whatever? And ultimately, the truth is, I actually cleaned the entire mold out of the mist coat. I was literally about two inches from the end, and it'd been sat there for like 10, 15 minutes to the point I've known I'd have had this awful line up it. Mm-hmm. So I just cleaned the whole mold out and then scraped all the mold because I was cleaning out with a fucking steel taping knife. And I just varnished it and then cast on it again like 20 minutes later. And something else went wrong, but I just got on with it and made it happen. And I'm sat here now and it's probably the most popular piece we have in the entire showroom. Point is, if I'd have just given up or, you know, if I'd have tried to make it perfect or whatever, you know, ultimately I wouldn't have got it done. So I know it's a bit of a tangent, but I just wanted to say, I feel like sometimes that people might be listening and go, no, I I wouldn't do that. And ultimately, you know, don't fucking kid yourself. You know, think about what we're doing here. We're not saving lives or making concrete. So... Um, you know, yeah, well done for getting I mean, it done. Yeah. Well, the, one of the things is, I guess I haven't done a video on it yet, but like I have a somewhat, I guess, somewhat unorthodox way of spraying. Like I have, I have centered 
my spraying around uh let's see less than perfection i guess is a, a good way to put it like like i don't care at all about this what gfrc is supposed to look like at all at mm -hmm. like i think it's that's one of the things where i think it's the it holds way too many people back so to put it in perspective my spraying is set up in hopes that something will go wrong because that's what makes my pieces unique. I do not, I, I don't really call corners anymore. I use Portland for reference. Like this isn't like rapid set where it's setting up so quick that it doesn't really matter. I don't care. Like my edges are, they're not rough. Like it feels bad to rub against them, but they're, they're not this clean, crisp transition. I don't like that. I like getting sand in the corners. Like that is one of the best things ever, in my opinion. So yeah. for a piece like mine, like if you're spaying something and it's very clean looking, I don't know that you would have been able to get away with doing what I did. You might be able to, I don't know. Cause I don't spray that way, but I was able I to grind through quite a bit and you can't tell because that's just how my spray is set up. I'll tell you a little secret, but I'll, I'll whisper it for everyone to hear. My favorite saying, do your best and glaze the rest. That's all I'll say. Oh, I've <laughs> never used glaze. I hate glaze. I understand why people use it. And I, I that might be Life one of those saver. things where like your, your style, I think it, it depends on what your style is and what you can get away with. Like if you're wanting something that's very slick and very clean and very tight, yeah. your tolerances are much less than mine. Yeah. I spray like 60 to 80 percent of the mold and i just kind of go do whatever the fuck i want for a little bit and and like i only use fine sand in my mist so like my workability is trash like that like that, and people joke about like you get to the end of your mist coat and you're doing that like face coat jiggle or whatever where you're constantly shaking the gun like that's where i start <laughs> mm. like if if I just spray it and it just comes out just fine, my consistency is wrong as far as I'm concerned. See, the, th the thing is, I've made the mistake in the past of being like, I know we spoke about this in Florida when I met you, and then obviously we spoke about it many times since. I think you kind of, maybe, I know you, this is probably one of your next questions, but we talk about identity. I think when you start out, you look for that identity, and I think you, you want to emulate other people and other looks you know, whoever that may be or whatever that may be. And I think you end up then saying that, like, I've done it in the past, you know, and I, I admit I've done it. And, um, you know, I'm ashamed to say that, you know, I look back and think, you know, what a knobhead. But I've looked at how people sprayed. And everyone knows I can spray. You know, I've done that for six and a half, nearly seven years. I can spray anything. It's easy for me. You know, the point is I've made the mistake saying that that's not how you spray. And ultimately... The laughable thing about that is, and obviously meeting you, it was like, how do you, <laughs> how do you make a mottled finish or a rustic finish from spraying? You know, learning how to do that and how to spray badly to do that. In other words, Patrick, there are no rules. There are no you should do this way. Now, don't get me wrong. There is a better way to cure pieces. You know, whether that's you know felt, plastic, blankets, heat. You know, there's a better way to process things. You know, there there are certain things where personally, for me. I think there are there should be kind of quote unquote principles. I wouldn't say rules because I don't like rules, but principles like you know you should cure this way, um, you know you should process this way, you should you know build certain molds this way because it saves you time. But when it comes down to like the finishing and the artistic aspect, and I know your opinion on art, you know you know what that is an artistic <laughs> expression, and I'm not saying what we do is art at all, but I think that ultimately. There's no, there's no set rules here, you know. There's no, there's no set rules in the sense of finish when it comes to finish, texture, look, and that kind of thing. Yes, you know, stick to you know less than thirty-two percent water. You know, don't go to fifty percent. But then again, saying that, you know, if you're doing that for a particular look, well, that's the thing, isn't it? But that's the thing. That's what I'm saying. So that's a kind of principle, you know. If you want to go above that, as long as you know the pitfalls of it, 
then ultimately, as long as you understand that, the thing is, Patrick, you understand that, you get why. Somebody new listening to this, if I was to say, yeah, go and do 40% water because you'll get this kind of look, it'll peel away, it'll shrinkage crack, it'll do these things. They're not going to have the requisite knowledge and experience just to understand why they're getting that or why it's happening. Do you know what I mean? So I think fundamentally you need to understand the why first before then you go and break the rules. I think it's important to understand the rules first is what I'm trying to say, and then you can go and break them, you know? That's mm-hmm. that that's for me now where I stand. It's like I don't I'm not that fucking pretentious where it's a case of you should spray this way or you should do it this way, because that is for me, then you're limiting yourself and the knowledge that you can yearn from other people going forward because you think there's only a certain way you can do something and ultimately there isn't. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, I it, I think it has it's easy to delineate in a way of uh the you have to do it this way does not apply to aesthetics yeah. hmm. the you have to do it this way does apply to like the science related things and the technical yeah. aspect of things like if you want a strong mold you have to do this if you want a good cure you have to do this if you absolutely, want the yeah. absolute strength you need to do that like those things are completely independent of in a lot of cases are completely independent of the aesthetics. And I think that's where people transition those over to the aesthetics. And that's where, that's where I get a little frustrated because like, well, now you told me that completely separate though. Yeah. Like I, like anytime people start talking about that in the forums, like that, that's something that just sets me off the quickest. Like, because there, there are other people who aren't going to mention anything who are just kind of sitting on the sidelines reading that. Sometimes there are people who have only been making concrete for a couple months, maybe a year or so. And maybe there are people who are making it for like three, four, five years or whatever, and they still haven't made that jump. They keep seeing these reinforcing conversations of like, oh, well, you have to do it this way. And I'm just like, no, no, you, you absolutely don't. Like, don't mm-hmm. argue about it. Like, nobody's right and nobody's wrong. Unless you're saying you absolutely have to do it this way, then you're wrong. But yeah. Um, don't brag about like there being a gajillion fibers in your mix and you can't see any of them. Like that's not relevant to what we do. Like use the backer and use only the backer. Like don't put a face coat in, see what happens. Throw random powders in, see what happens. Like I have thrown concrete directly against grout. I've thrown it directly against BR310 which is a super plasticizer, like a really strong super plasticizer for people who don't know, like just to see what happens. Mm -hmm. I've put it, I have squirt uh, BR420 into a mold and cast straight against it just to see what happens. Like some of them look completely stupid, but you don't know until you try. So that's where I kind of get off. I know that you've got to go here somewhat soon. So let me, we got to get back on the rest of the stuff. (laughs) <laughs> no, I've no got, um, it's, 20, it's 20 to 6 I have got now I've got to leave here in about 40 minutes so I've got about 35 minutes so but the thing is oh, okay. I must have got to go you, your next question was about how do you develop an identity but, yeah, that, we but don't you think we haven't even finished the shower pan yet we haven't even finished the fucking shower pan yet haven't we I thought we finished that it's a fucking sink on the floor we haven't even talked about grouting it or processing it or sealing let me go, it, okay. or transporting let me go on to it, ground, installing then. it. <laughs> hey, okay, and here, here's a new part of the podcast. Haddock, Haddock, Haddock's quick fire round, right? Grout, okay, like genuinely grout. Now, grout. What I do is, and it's you know, I sell Kodiak Pro. Woohoo! You know, everybody's gonna go. Oh, here he comes, a salesman. I I sell Kodiak. I use it. That's all I use now, right? The reason I say that is my grout now and how I do it now is better than what it was before. So how I grout is 50% Radmix, 50% Portland, a pinch of plasticizer, cold water. I don't use any ice. Cold water, um, 4% um, stage 2 accelerator, um, Strinix, and obviously pigment. Now, I I have gotten to the point now where I can, like, I've got half a percent pigment in that actual mix or 1% in that actual finished piece of concrete. I know that I need roughly similar to that or 0.6 or 0.7 or sometimes 0.4. You know yourself how much grout, how much pigment I need in that grout to get it close. Now, I basically 
figure out I need five grams of black and then I tweak it with, with more black or more white to get it where I'm happy. So I'll go over to the piece with the grout mixed up and mix it with a, um, um, a bucket trial, a margin trial. I don't use the drill mixer because it adds heat and friction and the grout goes up too quick with 4% accelerator. So I just mix it up with a little margin trial and I go over to the piece and I go, right, okay, sometimes you're lucky and it's spot on. Sometimes you need a bit more black or a bit more white or sometimes a bit more warm gray, whatever. Once I've got the color defined, I have a my tools that I have are a, a water bottle to mist the surface, green scotch bright pads, a car buffer, and um, a plastic taping knife. Now, I work in small sections, so let's keep it simple. I'm doing a countertop. It's um, two and a half foot, three foot wide. I don't know the measurements, but it's like in the UK, it's between 600 millimeter and 700 millimeter wide. Doesn't matter how long it is. It could be four foot wide. It could be an island. It doesn't matter. But I work in sections that are about 12 inches, something like that much, whatever that much is, like four, it's about 12 inches wide. Doesn't matter how deep it is. It's 12 inches wide, right? I will then mist that surface with the bottle. I then take my plastic knife, get my grout, and I slap the grout onto the concrete. I then tape and knife it off. Um, in fact, it's not a tape knife. It's actually a, it's a Venetian trowel um, that I use, a steel one. And I, I literally don't just go in one direction. I go basically in multiple circles, like figures of eights. The reason being is if you just go, if you just pull that grout towards you all the way, along you're only filling part of the hole because what ends up happening is you actually have air trapped in the hole where you just literally just drought it over one side of it by doing a figure of eight up up and down your piece you actually push all of the air out of the holes and get the grout in there and seated in there where it's just a touch higher make sense mm -hmm. yeah so i do that for that 12 inch section and i make sure that I leave a very thin haze. So I do all my figure of eights and then I basically just then gently scrape it back then, literally just one direction, taking the excess off. I then mist the next 12 inches and grout that. And I then basically go all the way along the piece. In the winter, I will finish the whole piece. What I then do is I then get a macar buffer with a, I think it's a red pad on it which is like those sponge pads you get for buffing on, you know, for, for waxing. I then literally, because the grout's still wet at this point in the winter, I'll get to the summer in a second. It's important to distinguish between the two different times a year. Different for you, because you live in the fucking jungle. But I digress. <laughs> um, I live in fucking freezing cold England. But I digress. So I've grouted the whole piece, and it's nice. And I go back to the start, and I touch it, and it's nice and damp still. It's not soaking wet. It's nice and damp. And that's another important thing. The consistency of my grout is like milkshake. I then take the mm. car pad, the buffer, and I literally buff the whole piece from one end to the other. Literally work the whole piece with the buffer. What that does, it generates heat on the surface. So it actually creates a thin skin across the top of the grout and heats it up and helps the accelerator in the grout to kick. So... And it also basically forces the grout right into that hole as well. I then buff the whole piece. And then the trick now is to kind of go away for five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. But you want to basically come back. And when you rub the top of that surface with your fingers, it starts to go a little bit dusty, right? Mm -hmm. Now, when it goes dusty, that's when I take the green pad put it on the car buffer again, or you can use an orbital, it's up to you. I use a car buffer, put it on the car buffer, and I then green pad the whole surface, and that literally takes the whole thing back pretty much to bare concrete minus a very thin, and I mean thin layer of grout. And when I mean thin, you, I can see the sand grains again because I wet polish. I can see the sand grains again in my piece. I can see the stone in the terrazzo if I'm doing terrazzo. And then I green pad the whole thing and um, make sure you're wearing a mask because it can get a bit dusty. And then li literally, that's it. And then I can leave that for four hours if I've done it in the day or if I do it late at night, I'll do it in the next morning. Um, or sometimes, like I did this it, 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 this winter when I did that Terrazzo kitchen I showed you, I did everything I've just said. So I got to the very end, green padded it. And then just for good measure, I then grouted it all again 
exactly the same process because there were some holes that needed to be filled twice. And then I did the whole process right to the very end. And then those kind of bigger holes that were still a little bit low, I just got a very small amount of grout and used my, my blade, Stanley knife blade, and just basically just, just filled them in so a little bit higher. Went away the next morning, came back, wet processed it, acid washed it, done. That's it. Now, you probably find there's people in this industry that will say that when they've grouted, they have grouted, wet polished again the next day and acid washed, and it pulls all the grout out or new holes open up. Genuinely, two things, doing the method I've just explained doesn't do that. You And with the mix I now use, I use rad mix, obviously, because it's so dense and the grout's so dense, it doesn't happen. Like genuinely, I can wet polish and acid wash again even four hours later and no more holes open up. If it's the winter, I generally like to leave it six hours. So like I'll do it really in the morning and before I go home, then I'll do it. Just leave it a little bit longer because it's cold in the summer. Don't really need to do that. I can leave it four hours. Um, I'm never like Simon Tipple in a rush where I've got to do it immediately. You know, <laughs> I, he, he's just he's just a madman. But he's I digress. Bonkers. <laughs> yeah, but then the thing is because because of the way I'm grounding with that green pad and I'm taking all the excess off, I'd never just I'd never just spot grout because there's always that chance of ghosting. But oh. there's hardly any work. There's hardly any work the next mm-hmm. day wet polishing, and yep. the acid doesn't open up more holes. So that's that's the way I grout. That's my secret. And I, I didn't, Justin McRae first told me about the buffer many years ago. So I have him to give the credit for, for that. But in terms of the green pad and stuff afterwards, that was honestly just watching people in the, the flooring world and how they grind and seal floors um, for a living, just watching what they do and just asking the right questions and looking up old threads and how they do it and kind of just, you know, taking a little bit of information from here and a little bit of information from there and kind of just put them all together. And then mm-hmm. trying it for myself and see what's worked. But genuinely, I can grout a piece that's been terrazzoed within, like, when I say 45 minutes, I can grout it once, you know, buff it, green pad it off, grout it again, buff it, green pad it off, you know, leave a little tiny high spot in the lower voids, in you know, the bigger voids. That's it. And it genuinely, one piece might take me 15, 20 minutes and it's done. And then I haven't got to come back and grout it again or any of that, you know. <clears throat> I hope that helps somebody because. Yeah, I, you know, I I hate grouting. I think it's uh, yeah. you know a giant waste of time, but that's how I do it. Yeah, see, it's I interesting to. that I thought about trying to do that method that you taught me for the mm-hmm. well, one the what the buffer that I got was a piece of trash and like almost lit on fire like the second time that I used it. So that wasn't even an option. But um, because of the ups and the downs of the uh, uh, the shower tray, I didn't even attempt that with this one. Um, I'm apparently just significantly lazier than you are. Uh, I mixed up my grout to like a, to, uh, what would it be? Like a peanut butter consistency. So pretty thick. And then I just misted the whole piece and I just smeared that grout all over the place. I was like, fuck this shit. It's just, just everywhere. And then I took a uh, lightly damp sponge, just like a yellow sponge that you'd get from like a home center or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I just sat there and just rub, 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 rub. And that worked insanely well. Um, I am, I, you just basically just keep rubbing it. Like you said, it just starts to heat up and then it starts getting thicker and thicker and thicker. And then you're, just, you're really just, because the thing is like not trapping air in there and just like really just smashing that ground in there. It worked so well. I was shocked because I thought I would, I would have sworn that I would have had to grout that piece twice. I was able to only mm-hmm. grout it once, even with a, what did I end up doing? I ended up doing a hundred percent muriatic acid to acid etch it just because it's a shower tray and I didn't want to add any. Yes. Uh, like yeah. Yeah. So like I asked and I didn't have any, not that I could tell, um, no little pinners that showed up. So I don't know. I'm going to try it in the future and see if that works again. Cause it was so quick. Cause I didn't have to worry about like, like don't put too much grout on, but I'm like, I'm used to just throwing on like obscene, am- obscene amounts of grout with my style. So I would, I would, I would take a guess from my experience with it. I think in the past people have used like a wet polymer based grout. And ultimately I, th- I think mm-hmm. it's not, I think it's a weak grout. I think you'd even be better go into the shop and buy like a tile grout a non sanded tile grout rather mm-hmm. than what we've used, because I think sometimes it's just not cured enough. That's why, 
know, people are having problems. Even when I used Accelerator with it in the past, it was it just to the point where I just wasn't cured enough for it to, you know, to be polished and acid washed again the same day. You know, maybe mm. I'm wrong. People have had better success than I have. Um, but for me, this has been the quickest and most, um, oh, the easiest way for me to do it. Now, a small caveat to that is, I don't really grout anymore unless, because I'm, I, you, know, you know me, I like spraying, but I genuinely SCC quite a lot now, unless I'm going for a shitty spray, which incidentally I can actually forget to do. <laughs> I just start spraying, yeah. not so used to spraying normally. Actually, I'm actually like, we meant to shitty spray this. And I'm like, yeah. So what are you going to do now? I'm like, mm, I'm going to have to glaze it. So yeah, do your best place of rest. <laughs> but no, I, I, I digress. Um, so I generally don't have to grout really and if it is it's only kind of the edge of the few small pinners so i actually i actually just take out the mold process it acid wash it let it cure for a couple of days whatever um and then seal it and then i will actually seal after uh grout after sealing and i don't do it the same way i basically i because you've sealed it you know even if it's ict or amiga or whatever um a coating in other words i don't use a steel steel taping knife because obviously or steel venetian trial because it can scratch it or damage the surface so i do use a you know like a bondo comes with a plastic little plastic one i use one of them i will then basically just grout the piece as i've just said so kind of little figures of eights all over um kind of let that haze up for a minute and then um i just then um clean it off with a with a white scotch bright pad um, and a mist bottle of water if I need to, or what I've been doing lately when I've done it is my fabled, my fabled wax. Um, I'm not going to say what it is out of respect for my mate who told me, but I've told you what it is. It's got a funny name. If people want to know what it is, by all means, you can message me, but I'll spray the wax on the surface and then use like an Abrolon, like a 600 grit or a thousand grit Abrolon, and I'll just buff the whole piece and that'll take all the grout off. The wax is mainly there to break the surface tension and to kind of wet out the grout a bit so it comes off easy. Um, and then I just blow the pad off every so often to get all the junk off it. Um, but that's that's the way I do it. Now, I still use Radmix in Portland. I just replace, instead of using like 100 grams of water, I'll actually use a water a waterproof, um, it's like a resin-based polymer that we have here. And obviously, you know, I don't have polymer in the mix, but the reason I do that is because then my grout, once it's cured, is waterproof so i don't have to worry about the little pinholes and stuff being sealed so i use that you know i use that resin based polymer that we have here um as the binder if you like um just to basically give me that peace of mind that if the grout is going to get wet outside or in a shower tray or in a sink or whatever that water's not going to hurt it because it's waterproof once it's cured do you know what i mean so and then once i've done that taking the grout off i will actually just take you know, like a baby seal you know a beeswax spray the surface clean it off and done People are going to have one hell of a time navigating all the shit that we've talked about in this. <laughs> you have to split it into um, sections, won't you? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm going to have to. It's going to be interesting. I guess just let's quickly hit on my transbone install. If there's any, I mean, trans transporting it seems pretty straightforward. I mean, get it up on its edge if you can, and just bring it from point A to point B. I mean, we, I was installing it next door, so all we had to do was put it on like dollies and just wheel it over. So that. That was pretty easy. I mean, just built an eight frame, a frame, put it up there, had foam underneath it, clamped it yeah. in place, and then ratchet strapped it, and then just wheel it away, and off you go. Um, that was pretty straightforward. Um, uh, the install is pretty interesting. Uh, we did have to seal the bottom of mine because we were putting it down on a mortar bed. Um, so I did have to leave it on its edge and seal the bottom of it, seal the bottom of it with stamp shield. Um, and then I did talk to the guys at Trinic. They said it needs to sit for 24 hours. So I, I made sure to keep it up on its head for, for 24 hours to let, uh, they're like, you, you should probably let it cure a little bit longer if it was going to be aesthetic. But he's like, since, since it's going on the bottom, he's like, you can just lay it straight down and, and after the 24 mm -hmm. hours. Um, so that was nice. Um, Let's see, I sealed the main part of the piece with seal hair. That's obviously pretty easy. Um, you can check out the seal hair forum to see how to do that. Um, install. 
how did we do ours? Let's see, I used, I laid two inch PVC pipes on the floor running perpendicular to the direction that I needed to, to slide, well, parallel to the direction that I needed to slide it. So we set the shower pan on top of the two inch PVC pipes. Mm -hmm. I troweled on the mortar bed and then we just slid it into place, tilted the front end up so that the back was sitting on the floor, pulled the yep. PVC pipes out, lowered it down till it was pretty close to the floor and then pushed it all the way against the back wall. And then we just set it down since there was a three quarter inch Oh no, how thick was the mortar bed height wise? Height wise might have been five eighths thick. So we didn't really have to like drop it and just let our hands go out. Like we had a little bit of wiggle room because the mortar bed was so thick. Um, pushed it into place and then that was it. We uh, are anticlimactic. <laughs> what, what, the ones that we installed, we've just used uh, polymer based glue. I know that you call it PL over there. We mm -hmm. over here, the genuine name, the company that makes it is called Evo Stick, but the product is called <laughs> Stick Like Shit. So it's literally, it lit literally, it's called Sticks Like Shit um, Turbo. So it's in a black tube and it goes off in about 15 minutes. So it starts to tack up in 15 minutes. So it's like a, a faster setting polymer base adhesive. There is another one called the Dog's Bollocks um, as well, which comes in clear. That's good as well. It's very, very good. Um, we just use that to kind of glue them in place. Um, mm. And once once that glue's got hold, it ain't going anywhere. It's 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 staying where it's been put. Um, and then to silicon around it, I found this kind of joint silicon that goes to like minus 50 degrees centigrade, you know, like whatever that is in Fahrenheit, to like yeah. plus 80 degrees um, centigrade, like 170 Fahrenheit. But it's uh, mm -hmm. non-shrink. Uh, non-shrink, non-crack, um, it's flexible. So, you know, in the shower, it's perfect. So we use that. It's expensive. It's like more than twice the price that you pay for a normal oh, like yeah. shower silicon. But ultimately, you know, it's lasting for a hell of a lot longer than normal silicon would. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's and what by I, the way, you, I didn't I didn't say that. If I was to do a shower tray again, and I am asked this, what do you seal with? If I was to do it again, I've, I've genuinely thought about this long and hard. I've thought about, should I use stamp shield? Because it's fixable if you need to fix it. And it's only a shower tray. Um, you know, should I use, you know, Amiga? Should I use seal hair? Should I use another product or this, you know? And I spoke to a couple of people I highly respect. I'm not going to name them because it's not, you know, I don't feel like, you know, I don't think it's the right place to drop people's names in it, you know, when they give me information. But they have told me that I should use ICT. And that's not to that's not to plug. These people use other sealers as well. And the kind of the thinking they had was that, as we know, ICT loves water. Water helps speed up the reaction. It helps you know helps cure, you know helps the sealer cure. Their kind of thinking was along the lines of because it's only a wet area and it's gonna have water on it. Ultimately, ICT is perfect for that application because it's breathable because if water becomes, you know, water's the issue, but it's not an issue with ICT unless you trap it. But then what's going to be, how's it going to have trap water at the shower tray? That's the kind of thinking I was given. I may slightly be misrepresenting what they've said. You know, it's not adverbium was what they told me. I'm not, you know, but that was their kind of thinking. Um, and also the fact that it's easier to fix and then obviously a topical in a shower, if, if should you need to fix it or should it need resealing in five years, whether you're being paid for it or not, um, mm -hmm. it's an easier sealer to fix. So based on what these two have told me and these two people do shower trays, you know, a lot more regular than I do, I'd probably stick to that in future um, and just seal with ICT. Easy to fix. Mm -hmm. Looks good. It feels good. You can get a really nice acid wash on it um, and then it'll mm -hmm. feel like a nice kind of, textured melamine, you know, because ICT is not a topical, it's a reactive, so you get great slip resistance, even when it's soaking wet. And yeah, it it gets better when it's actually being soaked with water. So yeah, that was one of the concerns. Interested. Yeah, that was one of the concerns of me using seal hair in the shower was um, so you get that really, really nice, heavy acid wash on that. Well, you're, you're essentially filling those divots with your sealer. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so that was a little bit of a concern with mine, which is why I ended up using a hundred percent muriatic acid. I did, I started with like 20 to one, just to see what happened. Then went to 10 to one, then went to four to one. I was like, ah, screw it. Blah, 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 blah. And then just you know, be careful because that shit will burn you quick. But yeah, yeah. Um, that was that was one of the concerns of mine. But like, I guess this is one of the points where um, leaving off the context is almost detrimental to anybody listening. Is the two people who will be using this particular shower are teenage girls. So I don't have anything against ICT. I use it for plenty of my other projects. I was mm-hmm. not comfortable using it in this particular case because if somebody's going to destroy it, it's going to be two teenage girls. Um, there's not going to be anything used in the shower that I'm concerned about for seal hair. Um, so just to give context to anyone listening, I was going to go with ICT. Uh, and the reason that I switched to seal hair was because of the two forces of nature that will be use, using the the shower um the That's other thing no. was hmm? no go on turn on sorry well the the other reason that i used it was for aesthetic reasons i like the way that the color that they picked and the style the aesthetic style that they picked i think looks better with uh seal hair so there was an aesthetic component as uh, as well and that's it may be dumb, but like aesthetics are extremely high up on my list of importance. So th- those are the, the reasons for that. Not to say that anybody should use one or the other. It's there's things that you have to take into consideration, and those exactly. are pushing me in the direction I went. One hundred percent. You know, I sell ICT, I sell Kodiak, I sell Omega, and I from day one I always said when we sold things, and I told it to Brandon and John. You know, ultimately I'm never going to tell people that. You know, you have to use this because, you know, at the end of the day, I'm British and we don't like the hard sell over here. We hate the hard sell. So, you know, and I say I never liked it. You know, there's 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 other companies that sell things here and they've said in the past that, oh, this is the best stuff ever. And then next minute they're selling a different product and that's the best stuff ever. And that's happened like two or three times with a couple of sellers here. And it's like, well... For me, it's like, you know, you're just taking me for a fool. Whether they believe that truly or not, I don't know. But ultimately, you just think they end up full of shit. So, you know, I think you get to a point where I always said that I'll be honest. I will never force anything upon anybody. And I will just give my opinion, you know. And I think I've spoken to so many people in this industry about this. You have to do what you feel is right for your business, you know, and, and for, for your customers at, at the end of the day, you know. And some people like now... I had, I had asthma as a kid, like bad asthma. And I've used, I've used seal hair, stamp shield, Omega, extra C27, H12, every sealer. I think we all have. Now, seal hair is great, and I still use it for certain things. You know, absolutely. The only problem I have with it is the solvent. It makes me ill. And I've even got like a full, you know, respirator mask now to use with it. I bought recently. But the smell is awful to the point where I had complaints off the neighbors here because of it. Um, yeah. same as stamp shield you know and the thing is it got i come out and I, I genuinely i come out just a couple of weeks ago and actually like you stink because you could smell xylene on me um and it was because seal hair because it was like you said the color I, for this particular finish i needed the color enhancement I, I i needed it you know it was a shitty it was a genuine shitty spray and i needed the color enhancement from it to bring out that depth and the textures so i used it for that reason when I was using it, it came out and she said, you smell? And I said, I know I can smell it myself. And in my throat all night, and it's happened the last few times now, my throat was, was sore. And this is not bagging on seal hair. Please don't anyone take it that way. I love Cody Sandoval. I think a lot of him. You know what people like in this industry? Oh, Martin said it's bad for you. And it's not what I'm saying. I'm saying me, in my shop, I was like, the next day I came in, I could still smell it. My throat was sore all night and that's happened the last few times. And I'm like, you know, for me, it's like, I need to limit when I use this because it's making me and that's all I can go on. It's making me, you know, feel ill. Yeah. Now yeah. that's why, you know, that's why I'm like leaning towards things that are actually not going to harm me because we all have a life expectancy on this glorified marble. 
And ultimately for me, health is becoming the most important thing in the world. Do you know why, Patrick? Because at the moment I work in here on my own. And if I don't earn money in that workshop, our family doesn't get fed. And if I'm making myself ill by, you know, doing silly things, that's not, not wearing a mask when I'm mixing, not wearing a mask when I'm spraying, you know, cutting, cutting wood. You know, if I'm, you know, whatever that may be, if I'm not doing that, then ultimately I could be ill and I could be off and my family don't eat because of it. It's as simple as that. So that's for me, it's a very important thing. I want to be here for the long haul, you know, in life. I want to see my kids grow up. So for me, it's like trying to make cleverer and better decisions, you know, not dry ground in the concrete. And I'm going off topic, you know me by now. Everyone's probably rolling their eyes, but, you know, not dry grinding, not doing those silly things that we do. I'm trying not to do that. And part of that is trying to only use certain products like solvent based things when I have to, um, you know, for color enhancement or if I'm protecting the glazed finish, you know, because ICT, as much as I genuinely love it, it won't protect the glazed finish, especially some of the finishes I do. It, you know, it's impossible. Um, as in like a heavy glaze, it'll, it'll protect the light glaze, but the kind of glazing that I'm doing, like the court and finish, it won't protect the end of. It'll just rub away eventually. Um, but I'm just trying to limit it. Um, so the reason I give all that caveat is I think people have lost the point of that because I now sell something and think, oh, Martin's just selling something, and it's not. It's because I've learned things along the way, and I've learned what I should and shouldn't do, as in me. And I just want to pass that on to others. You know, one of my big mantras from elite fitness was live, learn, pass on. And that's all I'm ever trying to do. So when I say I want to use ICT in future on things like that, it's not because I sell it. It's because I can't take the smell of that product. And other people may be comfortable with that. And that's fine. I'm not. So I just wanted to clarify that, by the way. I know it's a bit random in, in the podcast, but, um, but the, the, re the reason is because I know especially lately, because I'm saying I would use ICT because two people told me who I respect. I know certain people are going to roll their eyes and go, oh, here we go again. So I just feel like I have to kind of justify why that is. So well, apologies. I mean, I, the I, yeah, but I act is your counterpoint in this particular instance. Like, yeah, no, no, I, yeah. I prioritize aesthetics. Like, I'll be very upfront with it. As long as the thing performs adequately for the, the job, I prioritize aesthetics and seal hair for me. I don't, I acknowledge that it smells like boo boo and it'll melt, melt your face off, but that's mm. part of solvents. It doesn't have anything to do with seal hair. All the solvents, you have to be careful yeah. with them. So like, Absolutely. I know that in order for me to use that, like I want to, I have to set certain things up in my shop. So I've got, um, I've got three fans that go in my shop while I'm using it. I've got one at the door that, that enters into our house because my shop is here at the house. I have one fan there that is a floor mounted fan. So the fan is roughly six feet up off the floor. That fan is pushing all the air away from that door. So I don't have to worry about are, is there, are these solvent fumes getting into the house? Yeah. That's not a problem. I also have a ceiling mounted one that's about halfway down my shop towards the garage door, the big slider. That fan then takes the air that is being pushed to it from the floor standing one out across the piece that I'm sealing to the door. And then at the door, I have a big floor one that's, I don't know, it's one of the big orange ones. It's like uh, uh, maybe two feet tall. It's a, it's a big sucker. Well, relatively speaking. And that sucker is on high and it is pulling all of the air from the shop and throwing it outside, and I have a respirator on the whole time. So if you have a bigger shop, you may not be able to do these types of things, so you would have to decide whether it's worth it or not to have a setup like that or put a setup in place. I don't know, but for me, in my small, small, shit, small space, that works amazingly well, especially when you put the infrared heaters on it. That smell goes away for me in like, I don't know, or six hours um so i in, in that sense i don't really envy the big shop that you have because i can imagine like getting that smell out of there is exponentially more difficult than me i've got such a small space to to get those fu those fumes out yeah. it's ultimately anybody that's listening and they got this far congratulations but only yeah. anybody that's listening you have to make the right choice for you 
your family and your business. Now, if that's using pig shit instead of whatever material, then fair enough. You know, you crack on. I'm not going to be the one to tell you you're an idiot. I'll just advise you when you come and ask me. And that's all I'll say is you do what you think is best. You know, test things. Like genuinely for sealers, I, I do test them. You know, before I started using ICT on kitchens and stuff, I genuinely tested them um, with Radmix um, to see how they performed so I could set my expectations so that I could set them for the clients. Um, you know, don't take a chance with things like sealers. You know, test them yourself and see what see what expectations you want and the ones that you want your clients to have um, and then go from there. Um, that's, that's all I'll say, you know, make your own decisions and that's fair enough. Some people don't like reactive. Some people don't like coatings and vice versa. You know, it's just a shame that as an industry as a whole, we kind of get so tribal and divisive over, you know, over how we protect our concrete at the end of the day. So, um, but I'm happy to talk about that on another podcast, but I've got like 10 minutes left and I think you wanted to ask me about developing an identity so I can briefly get on that if you want to. We don't, nah, mm -mm, mm mm-mm, There, there's zero chance that you'll be able to do that in 10 minutes. Zero. Hey, you never know. Zero. No, no. Zero. <laughs> Plus, that's something that I think would be good to do back and forth. Because, like, I mean, I have the erosion and the fossilized finish. And you've got the core 10. And then you've got some of the... No, I think that's something that, that we should just wait. Because... Yeah, it's fine, yeah. But four times longer anybody- than I thought it would be. <laughs> if Well, it always is. I mean, you probably... If you broke it down, you'd probably say the first... Two hours nearly. You could probably say a good hour of it is taken up by shower trays if people you know are that interested. But all I'll say is that essentially, if you can make if you can make a basin sink or a kitchen sink, I think you've you know you've got all the necessary skills to make a shower tray. You just need to take the, the curb into consideration. Um, you know the templating is the same, but again, just think about you know how you're going to lower it down into the into position. You know by you know mm-hmm. like we said previously, you know try and get your template out of that area. You know, once you've finished templating, you know, make sure you mark your template, video your template, um, you know, you can, like you said, you know, curve the back of PVC and kind of bend it for your mold. Um, you know, they're the kind of basics that, you know, people I think will glean from here, you know. Um, we never spoke about how we cast them, but, you know, spray it, pour it, you know, hand pack it, you know, you figure out what's best for that particular job. Obviously, we didn't, you know, cover an upright cast technique for the shower tray, but that's well outside of my skill level, so I wouldn't even entertain that question. Um, yeah. But I think people have listened to it; they're going to get all the information they need to do this. Um, absolutely, um, and then hopefully pick up a few other tidbits along the way from my my uh, my ramblings on. So, uh, but if anybody's got any questions, you know, you know, I'm always more than happy to answer them. Um, you know, hit me up on Facebook. You know my name, Martin Haddock. Um, I've got long hair in the picture with me and my son. <laughs> so just send me a message on there or on Instagram, Da Vinci Designer Concrete, and I'll be more than happy to help you. Thanks for checking out this episode. If you found it beneficial and you would like to help support the channel, the three best ways to do that is one, sharing it with your community that you think would find it beneficial. Two is to subscribe. And three is to use any of those affiliate links if you'd like to support monetarily. That's a no cost way to you. And we may get a commission if you end up purchasing something through one of those links. But as always, I hope you found something beneficial in this episode. And I look forward to seeing from you or hearing from you in the next episode. Thanks, guys.